Hey everybody, it's Angie and welcome to Hot and Flashy. In today's video, I wanted to talk about pH in skincare, why it matters, why it matters more in some products than others, why I sometimes test products with my handy dandy little pH test strips, and why I think that this can be a useful tool sometimes. So as you guys know, I'm not a chemist, I'm not a formulator, I'm not a dermatologist, I am just a user of skincare like you guys, but as you also know, I like to do research into what actually works in your skin. You know, I started my YouTube channel 10 years ago, and my main goal was to find out what worked in the realm of anti-aging. And so here we are 10 years later, and I've done kind of this experiment on my own face where I poked around, read studies, read all kinds of information to find which ingredients can really work to make a difference in your skin. And that's what I've put into my skincare routine. That's what I've done this kind of 10 year experiment on my own skin right here in front of you based on, and that's how I develop which products I'm gonna purchase for my skincare routine and by extension, which products I'm going to recommend to you guys. So I'll generally try to read as much of the research about an ingredient as I can. I'll form my opinion about what's the best form of it or what's the best formulation for it that I wanna use on my skin. And then that's what I go ahead and use. I see if it works for me. If it does, I stick with it. I'm not really swayed that much by, you know, the new buzzword, the latest and the greatest, because a lot of things have to really show me some robust research before I'll want to use it in my skin. So that's how I go about choosing my skincare. And when choosing my skincare, sometimes pH becomes a factor. Generally, it's not, but sometimes it's really, really important to make sure that your products are going to work right. So pH is used to measure the acidity or the alkalinity of a water-based solution. So you can't actually measure pH unless you mix whatever substance you have with water to get the pH. Now the pH scale runs from zero to 14. Seven is in the middle, so that's neutral. Everything less than seven, zero to six, is considered acidic, and everything greater than seven, eight to 14, is considered alkaline. So here's just a little graphic I found online that shows you the pHs of a bunch of different things, say, that you might have around your house, things like battery acid, <laughs> stomach acid. Water is neutral with a pH of seven. Our skin is actually slightly acidic. It tends to have a pH between four and seven, but recent research has shown that if you don't put a lot of products on the skin and leave it alone for a few days, its natural pH is more close to 4.7 or below five, which is slightly acidic. And the reason our skin is slightly acidic is because we have something coating the surface called the acid mantle. Now the acid mantle is made by our skin to protect it. It is a combination of sweat and sebum and dead skin cells, and yeah, it sounds gross, but we need it. It's really important in regulating our skin. It's really important in keeping things out. So the reason pH is important in your skincare is because if you use products that have a really high pH or a really super low acidic pH, you can disrupt that acid mantle and your stratum corneum, and that can cause problems with your skin if you use those things continually. So it's best to avoid using products that have either a super low acid pH, like lemon juice. I have seen a lot of Instagram stuff lately with someone just taking a lemon and rubbing it right on their face. That is way too acidic for your skin. If you were to do that every day, it is not good for your skin. It's gonna cause redness, it's gonna cause irritation, and it can really disrupt that acid mantle. Some research was recently done showing that a pH of below five for the skin is really the healthiest point for skin to be at, where it fights off aggressors, where it has less acne, where it has less dryness. But even if you do use products that are a little more acidic or a little bit more alkaline, the good news is that your skin naturally returns to its normal pH within about an hour of using something that's in the pH range of between about three and eight. So here 
here's just a list of some average pHs that most skincare is now formulated at. This is from the Paula's Choice website. She had a really good article there that explained a lot, a lot more than I'm telling you here today about pH and skin. So I'll link that below the video in case you want to take a look at it. When you're using products that have varying pHs, you don't have to wait between products when you're applying them because the ingredient that they use to adjust the pH will hold the pH there long enough for you to get it on your skin. But as you can see from the Paula's Choice list, there are only really two ingredients that require a pH outside of the normal range. Those are alpha hydroxy acids and ascorbic acids. She did mention beta hydroxy acids there, but I've seen newer research that shows that the salicylic acids might not actually need to be at a lower pH to be effective. But there is plenty of research showing that alpha hydroxy acids and ascorbic acid do need to be kept at a lower pH to get into your skin and so that they can retain enough of their acidity when they're in the bottle and so in the case of ascorbic acid that it can be stabilized in the bottle. Acids need to be in their free acid state in order to get into your skin. What happens to acids when they're in a higher pH formula is that they donate a hydrogen atom and that makes them an ionized acid rather than an acid in its free form. And in order to get into your skin, the acid has to be in its free form. Now there's a whole bunch of other stuff involved in getting the right amount of free acid into the bottle and there's all these calculations you can do and so it's really a combination of the amount of acid that you put in the percentage along with the pH that's going to determine the free acid inside the bottle that applies to all the alpha hydroxy acids and the FDA has just come out with recommendations for the formulation of alpha hydroxy acids and they recommend that there should be no more than 10% of the acid in a product and that the pH should be at 3.5. Now where vitamin C is concerned, this only applies to vitamin C in the form of ascorbic acid when it's in a serum that has a lot of water in it and is a fairly basic serum, okay? So there are a lot of vitamin C serums out there and the pH rule does not apply to probably most of them. The reason that it doesn't is because there are different ways of formulating vitamin C. There are different forms of vitamin C and I've explained this all in past videos, which I can link below and up here for you guys if you wanna check those out, go into more detail on them. But basically to date, there are kind of three ways to form vitamin C serums. The first way is the ascorbic acid in water serum, which should be at a low pH in order to stabilize the vitamin C in the bottle, in order to keep enough free acid in the bottle so that there's enough in there to get into your skin and do something, and so that it can penetrate into your skin. So there's been a ton of research done in the past showing that this works if the pH is around 3.2, 3.5, then there are ascorbic acid serums that don't contain any water. If you have an ascorbic acid serum with no water, then the pH doesn't matter because the ascorbic acid isn't dissolved. Most of those will have a silicone carrier or a propylene glycol carrier. So if it's still just in its powdered form, it doesn't really have a pH yet. Those depend on the water in your skin to dissolve the ascorbic acid, which you know, in my book, may or may not happen. Um, I've tried some, they can be scratchy, they can be, you know, assuming you do have enough water in your skin to dissolve them, the natural pH of just ascorbic acid is very low. It's like a two, so it's very acidic and it can do damage to your skin. And uh, when they create a ascorbic acid and water formula, they're actually buffering the pH up to 3.2 to 3.5. So with those, I feel like you can do some damage to your skin. They can be scratchy. They're just not that elegant. I haven't met one yet that I've loved. And then there are esters, which don't have to be at a lower pH. They can be neutral because these ingredients are stabilized. And the esters are derivatives of vitamin C that they've added an extra salt to it or an extra something to it 
to stabilize it so it's stable in the bottle. The most commonly used esters in skincare are magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, sodium ascorbyl phosphate, tetrahexyl decyl ascorbate. There's a newer one called 3-O-ethyl ascorbic acid. That one does say ascorbic acid, but you have to look for the 3-O-ethyl in front of it. That is an ester, so that's not pure ascorbic acid. Unfortunately for me, the research on those just doesn't pan out. They really don't have the efficacy research that I'm looking for. They don't have the ability to get into the skin. And especially what they don't have the ability to do is to change themselves into ascorbic acid inside your skin because ascorbic acid is the form of vitamin C that our skin already has in it. We get it from the food we eat but we can't make it ourselves so we have to supplement it from the outside and the inside so if you you know eat vitamin c foods that's fine some of it will get to your skin but you can supplement it but it needs to be in ascorbic acid so if you're putting on one of the esters even if they get into the skin there's really not that much evidence that they convert back into ascorbic acid in the skin so i don't love them but you can use them they're especially good for people who are too sensitive to use something at a lower ph rather than ruling out any vitamin c you might as well use one of these newer vitamin c's if you're going to use one i guess the one i would use is the 3o ethyl ascorbic acid or the tetrahexyl decyl ascorbate i recently did a video where i used my little handy dandy ph test strips to test a bunch of ascorbic acid in water vitamin C serums. And below that video, you guys asked me to test every other serum on the planet, most of which don't need to be formulated at a lower pH. So this is a case where sometimes pH matters and sometimes it doesn't. I wanna show you a list of the vitamin C serums that don't contain any water. These do not need to be pH tested. A lot of you guys asked about the Ordinary. The Ordinary does not make a water-based ascorbic acid vitamin C serum. Every vitamin C serum from the Ordinary is gonna be vitamin C suspended in a carrier or it's gonna be a ester of vitamin C. So here's a list of products that use the esters. This is a much more extensive list. This is a lot of stuff that you guys asked me about. What about this one? What about that, that one? These do not need to be pH tested. So if you went ahead and bought my little pH test strips and you grabbed one of your ester products and you dipped it in and there was no change, that's why it's formulated at a more neutral pH. It should have come out to about, you know, somewhere in the four to seven range. Below my previous video testing vitamin C serums, I included a list of my favorite vitamin C serums that I use, the ones that I recommend. These are all vitamin C serums that are water-based ascorbic acid serums, basically based on the SkinCeutical CE Ferulic. The research that went into creating SkinCeutical CE Ferulic was done by a doctor named Dr. Pinnell, and uh, they did a ton of research into vitamin C, how to get it into the skin, whether the esters worked or not, what pH you needed to get it into the skin, but I don't just base my love of water-based ascorbic acid serums on the one original study. They came up with the SkinCeuticals formula, not based on the original paper that had, you know, a very simple serum. They went and did lots more of experiments and lots more research after that. The later research by Pinnell and his group did show that you know, including vitamin E and including ferulic acid really help the ascorbic acid to stay stable and the vitamin E and the vitamin C work synergistically. They added in penetration enhancers because of course the research was done in pig skin. And you know, pig skin is used in science as the closest model to human skin. So they probably added, you know, a penetration enhancer. Um, and that is what's covered in their patent. Their patent that SkinCeuticals applied for and got, and which is now owned by the L'Oreal company, is for a certain formulation of vitamin C that describes the SkinCeuticals CE Ferulic formula. And so any vitamin C serum that I'm gonna use I want it to be based on that same research that went into creating that patent. It is really a beautifully elegant formula, in my humble opinion, that is the one that 
is proven the most to work in your skin. So when I am looking for a vitamin C serum, that's what I look for. I basically look for something that is the SkinCeuticals formula, but that I can afford, right? <laughs> so that's why I'm always testing vitamin C serums that are less expensive. From my very first video that I did on vitamin C, I didn't recommend SkinCeuticals. I generally want a vitamin C serum that costs me around 30 bucks and has basically the SkinCeuticals formula, okay? Since it's patented, no one can have their exact formula. So I went out and looked for things that were similar enough and that I think will probably have the same kind of efficacy in your skin. And those are the formulas that I have been recommending to you guys for 10 years. As an influencer, could I have made way more money by promoting and telling you to buy SkinCeuticals because it's what all the research was based on? Of course I could. But as a user of skincare, as someone who is doing this for myself, I just, I can't spend that kind of money. I can't spend $168 on a bottle of vitamin C that is oxidizing. You guys know, we've talked about it here before, the deal with ascorbic acid is that it's a very, very unstable molecule. And so being unstable, it turns brown in the bottle. And if you're gonna be selling a vitamin C product, people don't like it when it comes in and it's yellow or it's brown or they have to throw it away after three months because it's no good anymore and it costs them a couple hundred dollars or a hundred dollars for the serum. So I have always steered you towards less expensive vitamin C serums that were based on that research, but that don't cost as much. I'm not knocking SkinCeuticals. People love it, people swear by it. If you do, that's great. I have no problem with it. It is the gold standard formulation. Just for me, it didn't make any sense for me to buy it or to recommend it, which is why I've always recommended to you less expensive dupes of SkinCeuticals. And fortunately, L'Oreal didn't go after them, didn't take them all off the market, and now the patent expires in two years. So I think it's probably pretty safe to say that these are gonna be around and they're going to be mushrooming. Ever since SkinCeuticals came out with that vitamin C and that research, every skincare company has been trying to find a way to stabilize vitamin C and have it also absorb into your skin. And a lot of the research does show that you can stabilize the ascorbic acid in water in the bottle by adding different ingredients, by decreasing the amount of water, all kinds of other means. But nine out of 10 of them don't show that it can get into your skin. And that's really the most important thing for me is I don't wanna spend a dollar on a vitamin C serum if I don't know it's getting into my skin. So that's why that formulation is the one that I use and the one that I'm gonna to continue to recommend to you guys. That's my take on pH and if it really, really is important in certain products. So the takeaway from this is yes, pH is very, very important in the formulation of everything for your skin because too high or too low can really damage your skin. But that fortunately, most skincare these days is created in a very narrow pH range of between four and seven. There are a couple of exceptions though. Those include all the alpha hydroxy acids. So make sure that your alpha hydroxy acid is formulated at a pH of below four and that there is a reasonable concentration of it in there, say around 10%. Where vitamin C is concerned, not all vitamin C serums need to be pH tested or formulated at a low pH. There are some that are in formulas much like the SkinCeuticals that do need to be at a lower pH in order to get into your skin and work. I'll leave the links to my previous pH testing videos in the info box below the video along with a list of which products I've tested that actually panned out that were formulated in the right pH to get into your skin and work. I'll do both alpha hydroxy acids and I'll do ascorbic acid in water-based vitamin C serums. So that is it for today's video, everybody. I hope you found it helpful and informative. If you did, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. As always, I thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your watching. Have a great day and I will see you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.